Shalom, I'm Ryan White, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the Joshua Generation Show on Hebraic Roots Network. Help us spread the Word of God to all the nations. You can check us out on the schedule at HebraicRootsNetwork.com to see when our episodes are airing, or you can check us out on demand anytime on the web at HebraicRootsNetwork.com or on your Roku device on your television. You can check us out as well on demand anytime from the comfort of your own living room. I hope to see you there. Shalom, I'm Ryan White of Rooted in Torah Ministries, and today we're going to be starting a, a series talking about the suffering servant. Uh, it's entitled The Gospel of the Suffering Servant, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at Isaiah 53 uh, from a, a little bit different perspective. Isaiah 53 is one of the, probably one of the most controversial scriptures out there, especially between Christianity and Judaism. And the reason is, is because, of course, Christianity, uh, for a large part, bases uh, the faith in Yeshua on that, that verse, right? That is one of the major verses that shows that Yeshua is the promised Messiah of Israel. And so there's a lot of different uh, debates that go on. And the two main things that people like to discuss are uh, who is the suffering servant that's mentioned in Isaiah 53? Because it's kind of ambiguous. If you, if you go into the Hebrew text and you look at it, it's not really clear exactly who this suffering servant is. Uh, the, there's three main beliefs on who it could be. Uh, obviously, number one is Yeshua, whom, of course, we believe uh, the suffering servant is to be. Uh, it could also be speaking of Israel as an entire nation. A, or it could be talking about a, an elect group out of the entire nation of Israel. And so what we need to do is we need to be able to discern which group this is talking about uh, in order to be able to gain a, a better understanding of this. And uh, along with that, we're going to find some really interesting things. And the other thing is, that's, that's often discussed is the, the aspect of whether or not Isaiah 53 is talking about the suffering servant dying and resurrecting. Um, and so, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of, of things that we'll, we'll talk about with that. But what I would really want to bring out is that there's a lot more to that whole verse there, or that whole chapter of Isaiah 53. There's a lot going on there that is, is unfortunately kind of glossed over uh, because of the, the debates on who the servant is and whether he dies or resurrects. Uh, as this teaching series is entitled, it's, he's taught called the suffering servant. So let me ask you a question. Why suffering, right? Why did Messiah have to suffer? What is, what is the purpose of his suffering? If he died to satisfy the justice of God for the sins of man, why did he have to suffer along with that? So that's going to be kind of where we're going to investigate in this whole series. Uh, and we're really going to kind of look at some different angles, right? I'm not going to, we're, we're not going to say that, that something's wrong. What we're going to do is we're going to approach it from a, a different aspect in order to gain a better understanding so that we are better equipped to be able to go out there and, and be able to uh, talk to people who are, you know, perhaps anti-missionaries or even atheists like to, you know, come in and attack the scriptures and attack the character of our God because of what they perceive the scriptures to say, you know? It seems like they pick up a Bible and they read a couple verses and suddenly they're a scriptural scholar. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the original context of some of the things and look at the culture and the customs in order to gain a better understanding of what all these things mean. So the first part in this series we're going to be talking about is called, the, uh, is called Honor and Shame, right? Honor and Shame in, in the scriptures. And this is a complete mind shift. I've been studying this for a while now, and it's, it's very hard to, to grasp, uh, to get my, you know, my uh, mind around it, because we live in a culture that is very different, right? Our culture is based on guilt and innocence, okay? And honor and shame is, is, is somewhat similar, but there's some, some differences, and so we need to address what those are. Now, our culture, when I say our culture, I'm speaking as, as a uh, United States uh, culture, right? And uh, our culture is found in North America, 
in Europe and Australia. These are all based on, these are called, often called Western culture, right? And these are all based on guilt and innocence. However, the rest of the world, the Middle East, you know, uh, South America, Africa, uh, Asia, all of them, they are all, uh, they are all honor and shame based cultures. And so sometimes when we talk and we, you know, we can be saying the same words, but we understand something and they understand it completely differently. And so it, it really helps us out to understand that what they're talking about. Now, let me ask you a question. What culture was the biblical culture based on? Well, if you do the, the research, you'll find out that in the Greek world, in the Roman world, and in the Jewish world of that time, the pivotal value was honor and shame. In fact, it was so huge that it, it's, it really pervades the entire New Testament. We're going to see countless examples of, uh, of the, the importance of this and understanding the words of Yeshua, what he said, uh, the, the combat that went on between the, the Pharisees in Yeshua, the, the Sadducees in Yeshua, these are all based on this concept of honor and shame. So let's take a look and try to discern what is different between the honor and shame culture and our guilt and innocence culture. So the first thing is that uh, honor is based on public perception. Uh, if you look at the writings of, of some of the you know, extra biblical writings, we're talking you know, just secular Gre uh, Greeks back in that time, they would uh, oftentimes say, you know, it is most important what men think of you, not what you think of yourself. Our society is more based on my internal convictions. We're very individualistic, whereas they were very uh, group-oriented. And on our, you know, our convictions of what do I feel is wrong, and so a lot of times, you know, the, the message uh, that we bring as believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is trying to bring a personal conviction to someone, whereas in the biblical culture, this was a social value. They had to, to socially change the mindset in order to do that. And so uh, that, that's going to be the biggest key thing is that honor is something that is lost or gained in the public setting. Uh, whereas uh, with our culture, you know, it, the public setting sometimes, yeah, I mean, sometimes that is important. We do feel shame in our culture, uh, but it's not the same. The biggest uh, difference other than that, that public thing is the concept of a zero-sum economy. And what I mean by zero-sum economy means that there is a limited commodity of honor. Uh, within a family, there is only a certain mem a level of honor. And so uh, brothers oftentimes would, would uh, fight it out, you know, not, you know, not necessarily physically, but they would always be in, in contests to re who receives the greatest honor. Think about uh, the, the uh, story of the, the coat of Joseph, right? What uh, is commonly called the multicolored coat of Joseph. Why, why did his brothers, why were they so upset with that? because his father was showing him greater honor. He was elevated in status uh, above all of his other brother, brothers in honor because of this coat. And so it caused a huge problem. And we're going to see this throughout scripture, the, these contests for honor, right? Uh, in these, these uh, zero-sum economies, uh, there's only this, this limited amount. And so the concept is, is if one person goes up, guess what happens? Someone else or everyone else has to decrease in honor. Think about this. Think about in John 3 verse 30, where John the Immerser is talking uh, about Yeshua and he says uh, of Yeshua, but he must increase so that I, or sorry, uh, he must increase, but I myself must decrease, right? Why is that? Because if Yeshua is going to increase in honor and in fame, and we're going to talk about the words associated with this uh, in a little bit here, but if Yeshua is going to increase, John has to decrease in order for Yeshua to increase because there's, can only, there's only a limited amount of honor in that society. And so what does this do? This creates an environment where there is a, an envy of success. We see this. We can go to, for example, Matthew 27, verse 18. And we'll, we'll start back in verse 17. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Yeshua, who is called the Messiah? For he knew that it was because of the envy that they had handed him over. And if you trace uh, the whole story with the Messiah and the, and the Sadducees, he's in the, this constant struggle for honor. 
uh, with them. And so because of that, they became very envious of him. Why? Because he's constantly gaining honor. If you look at the stories, what happens? Yeshua says something and it says the crowds were amazed. What does that mean? That means Yeshua was raised up in honor level. And so, you know, that meant by default, the Pharisees, the Sadducees had to decrease as Yeshua goes up, and thus that creates envy. In fact, if you go to the Book of Wisdom, the Wisdom of Solomon 2, verse 23, uh, they actually write that, um, but through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his company experience it. So even, even the, the context of how uh, Satan entered into this world and caused the, the original sin was based on the concept of envy, according to uh, this, the, this is the wisdom of Solomon, which is, of course, an apocryphal writing, right? But what I'm trying to establish here by, by talking about this is th uh, a frame of mind, an understanding of how they viewed the world, if you will. Now think about some other things. Think about uh, Cain and Abel. What happened with Cain and Abel? Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Uh, Cain's was not. So what happens? Cain gets envious. He gets angry. Why? Because God honored Abel, and thus Cain had to decrease. And so because of that, he kills Abel. And think about, I mean, just really throughout the scriptures, when you see two brothers, it's always the, the struggle. Why are, they, why are brothers always struggling? Because there's a limited commodity of this honor that goes around. Now, one more example that's really interesting, if we go to 1 Samuel ver, uh, chapter 18, verse 7. This is right after David comes back from war, and it says, The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now listen to this. Then Saul became very angry, for this saying displeased him, and he said, They, may have, or they have ascribed to David ten thousands but they have ascribed to me thousands. Now, what more can have they have, or what more can he have but the kingdom? And from that day on, Saul looked at David suspiciously. So isn't that interesting? All that happened was women were singing that David had kid, killed 10,000, and, and Saul himself had killed 1,000. So they were, you know, they were somewhat honoring Saul, but the fact that they were honoring David more put Saul into such an envy that he makes this statement. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? Do you see how pivotal honor was to them? In that, that mindset, in that culture of honor and shame, someone being elevated to the highest status of honor in the entire nation was, was, was essentially like making them the king. That, that was how huge it was to him. So let's look at some of the di different uh, groups that would uh, have these, these uh, fights over, or these competitions, shall we say, over honor. Now, at the most basic level, you're going to have competitions for honor within the family. Like I talked about, you know, the firstborn son, he was normally assigned the status of, of the most honorable status. He got the double portion inheritance. Uh, he got to take over the family uh, business when, he was, when everything was done. He took care of the parents. He honored the parents when they had, you know, when they were in their older years. But as you can see with, you know, the, the Jacob's 12 sons, there was competition within there. Uh, Joseph got elevated above Reuben. And so this angered all of them because basically someone who they thought was supposed to be the least is being elevated to the highest, which causes them to all decrease in their honor. Uh, so you have within a family, but then between families within a community or a clan, there's competition between members within a religious sect, right? Within the Pharisees, there's going to be competition for who is the most honorable in the Pharisees. Uh, but then when you go beyond that, now you have a group of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are competing for honor against the Sadducees, against the Essenes, against the Sicarii, against all the other groups out there in the first century. Go beyond that. Now you have the Jewish nation against the Roman government, against you know, the, the Egyptians, right? All the different ethnicities are also battling it out over this honorable competition here. And then move up a step further, and this is where it really gets interesting, is that between the gods, there is an, a competition for honor. And you'll say, wait, wait, Ryan, there are no other gods. Exactly. But let's remember, 
what is honor? Honor is what is given to you by society, by the people. So because the nations of this world, because they believe in other gods, our God, Yahweh, is in a sort of competition because it's all based on the mindset of the people. Let's look at some examples. What happened when they came out of, um, out of Egypt? They get to the Red Sea. They go through the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is destroyed. And immediately in Exodus 15, they start the, their song. And in that song, what do they say? Mika moka ba'alim Adonai. Who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? Why would they sing that? We know, they knew that there were no other gods. Why were they doing that? They were ascribing honor to Yahweh. They were showing that you know, even though these gods didn't exist, in the mindset of the people they did, and therefore they were showing that our God, Yahweh, is the most honorable among the gods. In fact, if you look at the plagues of Egypt, there's been plenty of studies that have shown that the plagues of Egypt were specifically against the gods of the Egyptians. Why would, why would Yahweh do that? Because he is trying to show that he is the most honorable, that all these other gods, they're nothing. They are all completely shamed. And so each of those uh, plagues was designed to shame the other gods in order to reduce their status. And what happens when you shame the other gods? People stop worshiping them because they don't want to worship a shameful god. Because right? if you're worshiping a shameful god, what does that do to you? That brings shame upon you as well. Uh, so it was really important for them to do this. And it, it's kind of interesting because recently in the news, we, we saw something very interesting in, in this mindset. There was a Palestinian who was captured this summer uh, who the news reporters uh, came to them and they were asking him, you know, the, this, uh, he was from G the Gaza region, right? And they came up to him and they asked him, why is it that your guy's aim is so terrible? Why can't you hit anything? And you know what this Palestinian responded and said? He said, it's not our aim that's the problem. Our aim is true. The God of Israel changes the direction of the missiles in mid-flight. What is he doing? He is, he's basically acknowledging the fact that Yahweh is more powerful than Allah to begin with. And by doing this, he's showing the honor of Yahweh. And that's what we got to realize. What, what's going on in the world, what's going on in the Middle East today, make no mistake about it. This is a competition because in the Muslim culture, they, they understand this. They live on, in this honor and shame thing. Uh, and so what's going on over there is a competition between Yahweh, the God of Israel, and Allah, the, God, the moon God of the Muslims. Right? There's, that, there's this battle for who is the most honorable. And we've got we've to keep that in mind when we see the current events that are going on over there. And speaking of that, let me, let me go into a couple examples uh, that probably all of us see from time to time of honor and shame in these cultures. Uh, the Muslims, right? We, a lot, oftentimes you'll hear about the Muslims doing an honor killing. And this is, this is very sad. This is obviously is, is completely unscriptural. This is not what they should be doing, but this is what they do, right? A young woman uh, is raped uh, or, or whatever reason. She has, has extramarital affairs. Uh, oftentimes not because of her own will, right? She's raped. So what does the family do in response to this? They go out and they kill her. Why is that? Well, in their culture, when she is raped, that puts her to shame and it brings shame upon the family, even though it wasn't her fault. And so even if the family chose not to go out and pursue an honor killing, in their, their culture, in their community, that family would be shunned. That, that, that father would lose his business. That you know, No one would talk to them. They'd be socially isolated, which oftentimes could lead to death because now they have no way of getting money. And so in order to restore the family's honor in their pagan culture, they go out and they kill their own daughter in order to restore um, the honor. Now, you look at the scriptures. What do the scriptures say? No, you don't do that. You go and you find the rapist and you put him to death in order to restore the honor to the family. We've got to understand the difference between our God and their God. The other example that you've probably heard of is called uh, Hiri Kiri. I think is how you pronounce it. I'm not good at pronouncing Japanese. Uh, but this is when, for example, when a, J a Japanese businessman would fail at, at his business, 
he would take his sword and he would fall on his sword and kill himself. And in our society, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But to them, it does because, you see, by his business failure, he has brought shame upon his entire family. And so the way of restoring honor to his family, which honor is paramount. Honor is how you, you gain status in society. It's how, you, how you're able to, to have businesses and, and prosper in society. And so in order to restore his family's honor, he falls on his own sword. So in, in hopes, basically, that his family honor status is restored, therefore his sons you know, could be successful in the world. So that just kind of gives you a little bit of a mindset of how they can do that. Let's look at some other examples, though. Uh, between the gods, because this is something I really want you to, to understand is that, that Yahweh does compete for honor. And I know that, that sounds very strange to us because we think, well, Yahweh can do anything. Yes, he can. But Yahweh created us with free will. And so because we have free will, we have the, the, the free will to choose which God we want to honor, gods that are nothing, the non-existent gods, or the one true God of creation. Right? So he does have to compete. Think about the story in 1 Kings 18. What happened there? Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. And if you read through the story, what happens? Basically, the, the people were actually worshiping both gods. And, and Elijah comes up and says, look, you need to stop hopping between two opinions. If Yahweh is God, you serve him. But if the Baals are gods, then serve them. But make up your mind. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. And so they had a competition. They did it in public. They gathered all the people to Mount Carmel. Why? Because this is an honor competition. And so what happens? You know, the priests of Baal, they get up there and they start doing things. And what does Elijah do? He starts mocking them. He starts publicly ridiculing them, which is doing what? It's shaming them. And then ultimately, he goes and, and he puts the offering on the altar. And fire comes down from heaven and consumes it which shows that Yahweh is the one true God and is the honorable God. And, and the people's response, they choose to follow Yahweh. Yahweh is glorified. He's honored. That, that word glorify is the exact same word. If you look in your, your Hebrew, the word for glorify or glory and honor, they're the same word. They come from the Hebrew word kavod. Okay, so Yahweh is glorified by what we do. Right? And, and throughout the Torah, we're going to see there's many examples of how, uh, how God is honored. In fact, that's what the whole sacrificial system was about, was honoring Yahweh. All right. Um, so let's look at, there, there's two different ways you can get honor, two main ways. The first way is you can have honor ascribed to you, which means that it's not necessarily something that you go out in the morning and you set out to do. It's something that you're born into or something you gain through office. So the first one is lineage. Have you ever wondered why the Gospels start off in Matthew 1 with this is the genealogy of Yeshua Messiah and it goes through this whole long lineage? Why is that necessary? Because it's establishing, not only is it establishing Yeshua's right to the Davidic throne, but it's also establishing that, Yahweh, or that Yeshua is honorable. It's, it's showing an honorable lineage of his. Um, you can also go in, in the book of Sirach. Once again, this is just for cultural con context. It says in Sirach 3, verse 11, The glory of one's father is one's own glory, and it is a disgrace for children not to respect their mother. All right, so there's, there's a, an easy example there of how that is. And it's kind of interesting because I was talking to a friend of mine who's been over and did business in the Middle East, and she said it, it was very strange for her because she went into this person's house and was talking to them. And before they even got to business, the guy sat her down and started asking, who's your father? Who's your grandfather? Started going through her whole family history. Well, when I, I was discussing this, she was like, oh, that's because, why? They're trying to establish their, that she has an honorable lineage. Now, you can flip that around. Uh, Yeshua, what does he do? If you look in John 8, Verse 43, speaking to, I believe it was the, the Pharisees here, he says, You are of your father, the devil, and you want your desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and so on there. Right? So what is Yeshua doing? He's saying that their lineage is of the devil. Why? Because that in that culture, that brings shame upon them. You can also see this not, not just 
on who your, your father is, but what, your, what ethnicity you are. If you go a little bit further down in that verse there, in John 8, verse 48, they respond, it says, The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And Yeshua answers and says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. So right there, they try to accuse Yeshua of being a Samaritan because that would bring um, a, a disgrace. It would bring shame on him and lower his honor status. So it's really kind of interesting, all these, these kind of fights back and forth. And in fact, uh, you know, the term, actually even the term Gentile is used in scripture of this, this um, shameful status often. And that's why Paul, he'll write, you know, you were your former Gentiles, you formerly had this dishonorable status, but now you are fellow citizens with the saints. He's showing that they now have honor. Because for in that culture, it's not so important to, to have your sins, uh, you know, to be pardoned uh, judiciously for sins. It was more, what they were seeking was for their honor status to be restored, which included the forgiveness of sins, but it goes beyond that, that, that concept of just forgiveness into restoring the honor status of them. Uh, family name, reputation, and wealth. Uh, you see in Sirach, in Sirach 44, verse 1 through 15, it goes through this whole long list and calls out all the patriarchs and talks about how they need to honor them and, and sing their praises, right? Uh, on, you know, and flip side, what, what if your father is of a lower profession? Well, if you look in Matthew 13, verse 55, Yeshua, is, they, the people say about him, they say, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother's called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Right? And they go on through all this, and they, it says, And they took offense with him. But Yeshua said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and in his own household. Why is he saying that? Well, because if a prophet is in his own hometown, if he is, is in this honored status of prophet, what does that do to everyone else? It lowers it, them down. And so even, with, even so within a family, if one person is elevated, everyone else feels like they're lowered down. And so that's, that's the context of what Yeshua was saying there. Uh, with that. Now, what happens if you're not born into an honorable family? What happens if you're born a Gentile? Well, guess what? There's a fix for that. It's called adoption, and Paul uses the language of, of adoption quite frequently in his uh, in his his letters. Right? He says you're no longer for you're 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 no longer Gentiles, but now citizens through adoption. And there's you know there, there's several different verses that talk about that. And the whole concept there is that when you're adopted, in that culture, when you're adopted, it is, it's not like a you know, partial adoption. It's as if you were born into that family. You now receive that honor. In fact, uh, Augustus, uh, or sorry, his, his name was at the time was Octavian. He was actually adopted by Julius Caesar. And because of that adoption, it raised up his honor status up to the point that he became, later on, became Emperor Augustus just because of that. Now, likewise, if, if being adopted brings us honor because we are former Gentiles, we're adopted, we're now sons of the living God, i.e. we've been given honor, what ha can happen as well? Well, a father can disown his son. And if he disowns him, that is bringing shame on him. He no longer is able to keep that name there. Uh, also, who is your teacher, right? Uh, if you were uh, Paul, for example, Paul say, says that he was trained by Gamaliel. That is bringing him honor. There was a time actually when people were, were arguing about who they were of. You know, I'm, I'm of Apollos, I'm of this person, I'm of that person. And Paul says, straightens them out and says, no, we are all of Yeshua, right? And Yeshua is the one. He is our teacher and therefore we get our honor from him. Does that make sense to you? We're going to go ahead and we're going to take a quick break here and we'll be right back. Shalom, I'm Ryan White and I really hope that you've been enjoying all the incredible content here on Hebraic Roots Network. 
There's a lot of people out there who are dying to receive the good news of Yeshua, to, to understand the, the scriptures from a proper context, from the Hebraic context of scriptures. And we love to be able to, to provide this information to everyone. But you know what? We need your support because unfortunately, these things don't come for free. Help us provide the support for us to send this message out to the entire world. You can go onto HebraicRootsNetwork.com or give us a call at 1-800-657-9820. And there's several options. You can join uh, the T Tabernacle Team, which is a $100 a month donation. Or you can use the Gideon's Army option, which is a $50 donation. Or at any time, you can choose to do a one-time donation of any amount. Any amount can help support, send the message out to the entire world so that we can all know and love our Master Yeshua. All right, welcome back. We were left off, we are talking about the patron and the teacher, right? Uh, another way that you can gain uh, honor is through public office. If you're the governor, if you're the king, if you're the priest, or even the high priest, or sometimes even the rabbi, right? These things, these uh, public offices, if you will, they gave you honor. They elevated your honor status. Likewise, if you were of a what was not um, considered a shameful uh, um, public office, like a tax collector, right? If that was your your occupation. That is a shameful thing, and that's why oftentimes, you know, the Pharisees, they come up to Yeshua, and they're like, look, you're eating with these tax collectors. Well, these people, these are the shameful people of society, and Yeshua was going and eating with them, sinners and tax collectors. These people are shameful, and so you're going to bring shame on yourself by doing this in the eyes of men. But let's be realistic. Who should we be worried about is ascribing honor to us? The Father in heaven, Right. And so that's what Yeshua came and taught. That was the focus of his ministry. And if you look at it, that's the context of the whole of the New Testament, all the, the New Testament writings. They're focused on showing people they don't need to be shamed by society. They need to worry about what God thinks about their actions, not what other men think about their actions. Yeshua himself is glorified through giving him kingship. If you look in Daniel 7, verse 13 through 14, he said, Daniel writes, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And, he, or, and to him was given dominion, glory, remember that word glory is the same thing as honor, and a kingdom that all the peoples and the nations and men of every language might serve him. So Yeshua being given the kingdom, being given kingship, is giving him honor. It's, it's raising up his honor level. Now the last way that, that honor and shame is ascribed is ritual cleanliness. Uh, if you are become richly unclean, this is considered shameful. If you look, we're going to, uh, later on in this series, we're going to go into uh, what I call the leper messiah. Uh, it, it's looking at the, the concept of Yeshua through the, the, the understanding of Leviticus 14, which is where we see the instructions of uh, what the leper or the, the person afflicted with skin disease is supposed to do. And what, he, what does he do, right? He tears his clothing. He dishevels his hair. He covers his mustache and he, he yells out, unclean, unclean, and he has to live outside of town. That was the, one of the ultimate shaming things, is to be exiled, to be sent out of your land, is, is complete and utter shame. And so this is actually, and that, that's actually the context of Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapters 40 through 55 are all written in the context of the, the Jews returning from the Babylonian exile. So what is the biggest thing they're having to deal with? They're having to deal with the shame of the exile. Their God, the one who is so, 
supposed to protect them, sent them away, exiled them. Now, of course, this is not his fault. This is their fault. They, they ended up uh, bringing shame on his name because of their actions. And so he, in turn, shames them in order to bring correction. But this is what they're dealing with. They're coming back. They're, they're a broken down and shamed nation. And so uh, the Isaiah 40 through 55, very, very beautiful songs in there, um, all basically t speaking to Israel, comforting her in order to, to break, raise up her honor. And, and reduce, get rid of that shame of that banishment. Now, there's a story, a certain story that we're all probably very familiar with that has this uh, concept of ritual impurity bringing shame. The story of the Good Samaritan. What happens in the Good Samaritan? I never really paid attention to this until recently. It, sa it says, Yeshua replied to them and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Okay? Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road and saw him and passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to this place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Why would a priest and a Levite, first off, why did he specify a priest and Levite? Why couldn't he just say a Pharisee and a Sadducee? Because what do priests and Levites do? They go and they work at the temple. Well, what's, the, what's going on here? They see this guy by the side of the road, and he's not moving. He's bloodied up. He could be dead. The verse says he's half dead, which means in their, their eyes, he might have been dead. So had they gone over there and he was dead, what would happen? They would have been richly defiled. They would not have been able to go and perform their services at the temple. And what does that do? That brings shame upon them. And so what do they choose to do? Rather than to investigate whether this person's alive or dead, they try to preserve their own honor by going around him in order to, uh, you know, to, to preserve their honor regardless of what's happening. And Yeshua says, no, that's not how it works in my kingdom. In my kingdom, you are your brother's keeper. You want honor? Go help out your brother. If he's, if he's in need, you take care of him. That is how the honor works in Yahweh's kingdom. Now, that, those are all ways of, of, um, of uh, scribed honor. Now, acquired honor is what you do. You can go out and gain honor. And the biggest thing with this was called challenge and repost. And remember, all of this has to be done in a public setting. So this is how challenge and repost works. And, and by the way, challenge and repost is just uh, a theological, or not even theological, it's anthropological term that was made up to, to describe this, what was going on here. Uh, and it comes from, it's a fencing term. So basically, and, I, and I've never fenced in my life, but this is how it was explained, is that in fencing, uh, the person, they make a quick strike, they make a strike, and that's the challenge. And the, 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 other, the other person, when they're challenged, they're supposed to, to block it, right, and then make a quick strike back. And that's the repost. So how is this done in honor and shame? Well, first off, a claim of honor is made, whether by the person themselves or by someone around them. There, there's something that, that is done that brings honor to that person or brings up the fact that they're honorable. And so another party, they go out and they challenge that person's honor in the form of a question. And now it's up to that question party, that, that party that was originally given honor, if they make a quick and often witty response to that original question, uh, they gain honor. However, if they cannot give a good response to the question, they lose honor, which means their challenger receives honor, okay? And who determines this? The public, of course. So let's look at a great example. And you're going to see this throughout Yeshua's ministry. But this is, this is probably the most uh, clear example. Because remember, the, the writers of Scripture, they didn't need to write out this specific formula every time. Because as soon as people saw what was going on, they culturally understood this. But here we see it laid out perfectly. This is Luke 13, verse 10. And he, being Yeshua, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Shabbat. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. 
When Yeshua saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again, and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Yeshua had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and be healed, but not on the Shabbat day. But the master, Yeshua, answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Shabbat untie his ox or his donkey from his stall and lead him away to the water him? And this is the, right. So when, when the this, this synagogue official, when he said the six-day thing, that was the challenge to Yeshua. And Yeshua hears he's responding, you hypocrite. And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, i.e. someone who has honor because she is a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Shabbat day? And as he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over the glorious things that had been done to him. So very clear example that we see here of challenge and repost. The, fair, the, the, the synagogue elder challenges Yeshua because he healed, and Yeshua reposts, he does this quick response, and then what happens? It humiliates them, i.e. their honor status drops, and Yeshua's honor status is raised up. And you see this throughout his entire ministry. It's constantly, you know, and I never understood that. Growing up and reading these stories, it was like, don't, don't these Pharisees have anything better to do? Are they just like standing around and, oh, there's someone, let's go question him on some, you know, some uh, minuscule thing of the law. No. They, this was a social game that everyone played back then. They were trying to do this in order to raise their own honor level up and reduce Yeshua. But every single time, what happens? Yeshua responds and the crowds are amazed and Yeshua's honor keeps rising higher and higher, that which puts the Pharisees and the Sadducees, their level keeps going lower and lower and lower to the point that they get so envious and, and realize when I say Sadducees and Pharisees, I'm not talking about all of them. Look, there, there was over 6,000 Pharisees in the first century. There, there, and they, there were seven different types of Pharisees. There was uh, two major houses, Hillel and Shammai, right? So when we hear the term Pharisee, we can't just lump them all in together and just say every single Pharisee was bad. There was good ones and there were bad ones. And ultimately, who put Yeshua to death? It was ultimately, it was the Sadducees, right? Because the Sadducees, they controlled the Sanhedrin council, or yeah, they did control the Sanhedrin Council, but um, the, Sad the, Sa the Sadducees, <laughs> um, they were the priesthood, right? The priesthood was a Sadducean priesthood. And so when it says the temple guards arrested Yeshua, we know that it was the Sadducees who set this whole thing up. And they had to do it at night. Why? Because they would, knew if, if word would have gotten out, they wouldn't have allowed Yeshua to be crucified like this. Some other ways to acquire honor. Appraising, sanctifying the name, making one's name known, or making God's name known. Think about how many times uh, you see this throughout the scriptures that uh, you know, you, it says, call upon the name of Yahweh. Now, is that saying that, that if you want to be saved, you have to properly pronounce his name? No. What that's saying is you're calling on his name, his authority. Remember, when we see words in English, that's what we're seeing. They're words in English. Those words didn't originally appear there. What originally appeared there? Hebrew. In Hebrew, that word is Shem. And Shem, while it does carry the connotation of your individual um, name and, and the pronunciation with it, it's more associated with honor. Uh, and you can see this. Think about, think about the book of Ruth. That's a great example, right? Uh, Ruth, she, her husband died. And she had no children, and so Boaz marries her, and at the end it says, uh, it talks about, uh, he marries her and gives her a son so as to raise up the name of the dead, Machlon, right? Machlon was her dead husband, and yet Machlon's name never appears in genealogies. It's about restoring the honor of the status of the family. That's the context there. 
Another great example you see in Scripture is with the Tower of Babel. What was the, the whole premise for them building the Tower of Babel? They said, come, let's go make a name for ourselves. Or were they trying to pronounce, pr you know, produce a whole new name? No, they're trying to make a name, making an honor for themselves, right? Uh, a name is, is a person's honor. If something's done in the name of the king, it's done under the authority, which is based on the king's honor, okay? So likewise, just like praising the name, uh, calling on the name, making one's name known, raises honor, guess what happens when you slander the name? And by the way, when you look at the word slander in the Greek, guess what the word is? Blasphemia. Blasphemia is the Greek word. So blasphemy and slander are the same thing. When you blaspheme the name of Yahweh, you are dishonoring the name. You are, you are publicly going out and, and reducing the honor status of Yahweh in the eyes of the people. And that's why it's such a serious offense. Right? Uh, we can look. Let's look at Romans 2, verse 24. And that did not go where I wanted it to. Let's go to Romans 2, verse 24. And he writes, For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Okay, and let's go back up a little bit for, for context here. Uh, verse 23, you who boast in the law, do you not dishonor God by breaking the law? And then he goes on, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Where is Paul getting this from? He's getting this from Ezekiel 36, verse 20. It says, when they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of Yahweh yet they have come out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. So this is something that's very important. Our actions, because he's not the God of everything, he is the God of everything, but he's specifically known as what? The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is, has tied his name to the nation of Israel, to, to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so when those people who are called by Israel, who those people who are called by the name of Abraham, and, and remember, what's, what does Paul say? We are Abraham's seed and therefore heirs of promise, according to the promise. So if you are in Messiah, you are Abraham's seed, therefore Yahweh is your God. And so when you go out and you commit sins, when your, your actions do not line up with the Torah, what does that do? That brings dishonor to God's name. And he has concern. Right here, verse 21, but I had concern for my holy name. So when God has concern for his holy name, do you think that maybe we should pay attention? Something, something is going to happen that's going to restore his honor, and it may not be in our best interest to be on the side that is shaming God. Okay? Uh, in fact, when you go to Revelations, this is exactly the context of, of Revelations. Revelation 16, verse 9. It says, Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who was the power over the plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Seems pretty important, doesn't it? The, the whole idea that God needs to, to we need to glorify God. If, you know, right there, it, the people who are thrown into the lake of fire end up being the ones who blaspheme his name instead of glorify his name. They, the repentance brings glorification to the name of our king. Other ways, public, you know, obviously we've got public praise, but public rebuke. Um, the, the biggest thing that comes to mind is the commandment. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be prolonged upon the soil which Yahweh your Elohim is giving to you. What are they talking about there? Are they saying you can't ever, if, if your parents are doing something wrong, you can't ever say anything wrong to them? No. It says honor them. What is honor? Honor is something in public. So if your parents are doing something wrong, you should never, ever, ever in public correct them. Why? Because that brings shame to them, 
right? You wait till you're in private. And then obviously you're still doing it in a respectful manner. That doesn't, just because you're no longer in public doesn't give you the right to, to you know, uh, come against them in a way that you shouldn't. But the context of that is don't do it in a way that's gonna shame them in public. Do it in private so that you can have an honest discussion about the matter. Uh, and in fact, this whole public re um, rebuke, the mocking and the ridicule, this is, this is gonna be the whole context of Isaiah 53, right? Uh, it says that we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. It's, it's constantly uh, you know, talking about this, this servant in Isaiah 53 who is not looked up to in the eyes of men. They, they're scorning him. And what happens to Yeshua? The whole narrative on the cross and, and his, uh, the time leading up to his crucifixion, it, the crowds are mocking him, ridiculing him. And so they are, in men's eyes, they are dishonoring Yeshua. Uh, likewise, with the, the sacrificial system, I, I said I was going to talk about this a little bit. Uh, we see this in 1 Samuel 2, verse 29, about how the sacrifices honor him. 1 Samuel 2, let's start in verse 28. Did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to the altar and to burn incense, to carry the ephod before me? Did I not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Yahweh ascribed honor to the priesthood by giving them all the, these wonderful things, these things that brought them honor. And then he says, and this, you know, remember this is talking to Samuel, or not to Samuel, but to uh, Eli about his sons. Why do you kick at my sacrifices and at my offering, which I have commanded you in my dwelling? And honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel. Therefore, Yahweh, the God of Israel, declares, I did indeed say that your house and your, the house of your father should walk before me. But now, declares Yahweh, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me, I will be lightly esteemed. So th this is a very important principle uh, of, of the, the whole of Scripture, is that if we render honor to Yahweh, He is going to honor us. But if we despise Him, if we shame Him, if we bring Him dishonor, He is not going to honor us. And so these sacrifices, you can see, why did, you, why did they give the choicest parts and burn them on the altar? Because they were giving honor to Yahweh. They were, they were bringing them up. And you can also see this in Malachi 1, verse 7 and 8. This is talking to the priests who are, who are doing the wrong thing. You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say, the table of Yahweh is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is it not equal? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased? Would he receive it kindly, declares Yahweh of hosts? So even the, the, all the sacrifices themselves, the fact that the Torah says that they have to be tamim, they have to be perfect, they have to be whole and complete. Why? Because that's rendering honor to God. You don't give God you know, the, the, the leftovers, you give him your very best. And so by doing that, by giving him your very best, that in turn brings honor to him, and as we read, he's then going to honor you in return. Now, the physical body was also a, 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 essentially a playground, if you will, of honor and shame. The, the body could be honored by different means. Putting a crown on the head or anointing the head of a person brings honor to them. A elevation of the body. You, when you go and you look at the, the kings where they would sit in the ancient Near East, they would always sit on an elevated position. In fact, when they went into battle, uh, just like you know how Israel, they carried the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders up above everyone, well, so too in uh, the other kingdoms of the ancient Near East, they would carry a throne around them where their king would ride on that in this honored status. Uh, we see this in, in the New Testament, right? Yeshua talks about the best seats of the house. He uh, accuses the Pharisees of taking the best seats in the house, and he tells his disciples, you do not take the best seats in the house. You, you take the worst seat and wait for someone to bring you to the best seat. That way you're honored, right? Uh, sitting next to someone 
If you remember the disciples, they, they um, I forget the names of the two of them that were arguing over it, but they wanted to sit one at his right and one at his left. They wanted the honored position. And Yeshua said, no, no, that's not how the kingdom works, right? Uh, receiving clothing as honor. Think about Joseph. What happened when Joseph became the, the second in command, the viceroy of all of Egypt? Well, Pharaoh gave him a coat of honor. Um, Mordecai, in fact, Mordecai, when the king honored him, what did he do? He put a robe around him. When the prodigal son returned home, what does his father do? He puts a robe around him, restoring his honor and his sonship to him. Uh, and then, of course, when we get to the kingdom, what does the king give us? The king gives us new robes. We have new honor. We are, we are given honor in that. And, and likewise, along with the clothing, you also have jewelry. Right? If you remember uh, when Eliezer, he went to go get a bride for, for Isaac, he, what does he do? He, puts a, he gives her a, actually a nose ring. <laughs> he gives uh, Rebecca a nose ring. Uh, Joseph, he got a signet ring, and, and you, you see all these things throughout Scripture uh, with uh, adornment with jewelry. So those are ways that a person is honored through their physical body, but likewise, they can be shamed through their physical body. How do they do this? Stripping naked would be the, one of the prime examples. Yeshua was stripped naked as a way of shaming him. Uh, the, the woman who was ac accused of adultery, what do they do to her? In Numbers 5, they strip her shirt down, they expose her. Uh, and in fact, that was a, a common practice in, throughout the ancient Near East. If a woman was caught in adultery uh, or, or, and, and wasn't put to death, if she was accused of adultery and proven, but wasn't necessarily caught by two or three witnesses, uh, other nations, they would strip her down naked and send her out. And, and in, in Ezekiel, God talks about that. I don't remember the exact verse right now, but it, Ezekiel ta uh, talks about God stripping Israel naked and sending her out as the day she was born, right? It's a shameful thing to be exposed like that. Also, uh, putting one under the feet. In, in that culture, you gotta remember, they, they walked around with either sandals on or barefoot, and so you got a lot of nasty stuff in your feet. And so the feet were considered the most shameful part of the body, the most dishonorable part. And so, uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 through 28, he, um, he talks about Yeshua has to reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. Why? Because that's a shameful thing. And you see this in the, in the culture today. What happened when George Bush was speaking in Iraq? One of the reporters, they threw their shoe at him. Why? Because it's dishonorable. When they brought down the statue of Saddam Hussein, they went and beat it with a shoe. There was even a video I saw of two men who were, who were rapists that they had tied up in the public square, they tie these guys up, and all these women are just walking around beating them with their shoes. Why? Because they're publicly shaming them with their, their shoes. Uh, tearing of the clothes was, was something shameful. That's why the high priest could never rend his garment. It's because he's bringing shame upon himself and upon his office, and thus upon Yahweh. Uh, imprisonment or exile. You gotta remember, in that day and time, Prisons weren't used for violent criminals. If you're a violent criminal, you're put to death. Prisons were used as a, essentially as a way of exiling you, right? It was a way of, of confining you, which brought extreme shame to them. And in fact, even today in, in Japanese society, that's what they use, they use prisons for is a method of shaming people. Uh, it, it's, it's extreme shame to be cut off from society. You think about... Um, uh, the, you know, the leprosy, right? The leper is, is sent out from society. He's exiled. Uh, throughout the Torah, either, you know, a lot of times someone is either put to death or they experience karat, cutting off. It says you'll cut them off, i.e., you know, you send them out. They're, they're now outside of the camp. They are shamed. And so this, this sort of thing was very big and very, very harsh for them. And, you know, as I said, this is the whole context of Isaiah 53 is that Israel was just put to shame. God had sent them out. He exiled them because of their actions. And so they're dealing with uh, an, an extraordinary amount of shame. And so there's, there's a lot that had to be done in order to raise them up. Because to them, it wasn't, forgiveness wasn't enough. It, you know, even, even being brought back to the land wasn't enough. They had to have their honor as a people restored. That's their cultural value. Thank you.